First Amendment to the United States Constitution From Wikipedia, the Free Encyclopedia HTTP colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org The First Amendment to the United States Constitution is a part of the United States Bill of Rights. Textually, it prohibits the United States Congress from infringing on six rights. It forbids federal laws that respect an establishment of religion, the so-called Establishment Clause, prohibit free exercise of religion, the so-called Free Exercise Clause, infringe the freedom of speech, infringe the freedom of the press, limit the right to assemble peaceably, or limit the right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The First Amendment only explicitly disallows any of these rights from being abridged by laws made by Congress, but as the first sentence in the body of the Constitution serves all lawmaking or legislative authority to Congress, the courts have held that this extends to the executive and judicial branches as well. Additionally, in the 20th century, the Supreme Court held that the Due Process Clause of the 1868 14th Amendment incorporates the limitations of the First Amendment to also restrict the states. Section 1. Background. The original text of the Constitution generated some opposition on the ground that it did not include adequate guarantees of civil liberties. In response, the First Amendment, along with the rest of the Bill of Rights, was adopted. The process of adoption by ratification by the requisite number of states was completed on December 15, 1791. The text of the amendment reads as follows. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Section 2. Establishment of Religion Main Article, Establishment Clause of the First Amendment The Establishment Clause of the First Amendment is commonly interpreted as prohibiting the establishment of a national religion by Congress, or the preference of one religion over another, or religion over non-religion. Prior to the enactment of the Fourteenth Amendment, and for fifty-seven years thereafter, the courts took the position that the substantive protections of the Bill of Rights did not apply to actions by state governments. Subsequently, under the Incorporation Doctrine, certain selected provisions were applied to states. It was not, however, until the middle and later years of the 20th century that the Supreme Court began to interpret the Establishment and Free Exercise Clauses in such a manner as to restrict substantially the promotion of religion by state governments. For example, in the Board of Education of Curiestral Village School District v. Grumet, Justice David Souter, writing for the majority, concluded that, quote, government should not prefer one religion to another or religion to irreligion, end quote. Section 3. Free Exercise of Religion Main Article, Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment the Warren Court of the 1970s held that the Exercise Clause meant government must compel interest before passing a law that unduly burdens the practice of religion. Later court decisions retreated from this standard, permitting governmental actions which were neutral to interfere with religion, but Congress attempted to risk passing the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which the Supreme Court held was inapplicable to state and local government actions, albeit applicable to federal action. Section 4. Freedom of Speech Main Article, Freedom of Speech in the United States Subsection 4.1. Sedition Remarkably, the Supreme Court did not consider a single case in which it was asked to strike down a federal law on the basis of the Free Speech Clause until the 20th century, 
the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798 were never ruled upon by the Supreme Court, and even the leading critics of the law, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, argued for its unconstitutionality on the basis of the Tenth Amendment, not the First. After World War I, several cases involving laws limiting speech came before the Supreme Court. The Espionage Act of 1917 imposed a maximum sentence of 20 years for anyone who caused or attempted to cause, quote, insubordination, disloyalty, mutiny, or refusal of duty in the military or naval forces of the United States, end quote. Under the act, over 2,000 prosecutions were commenced. For instance, one filmmaker was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment because his portrayal of British soldiers in a movie about the American Revolution impugned the good faith of an American ally, the United Kingdom. The Sedition Act of 1918 went even further, criminalizing disloyal, scurrilous, or abusive language against the government. The Supreme Court was first requested to strike down a law violating the free speech clause in 1919. The case involved Charles Schenck, who had during the war published leaflets challenging the conscription system then in effect. The Supreme Court unanimously upheld Schenck's conviction for violating the Espionage Act when it decided Schenck v. United States. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., writing for the court, suggested that, quote, the question in every case is whether the words used are in such circumstances and are of such a nature as to create a clear and present danger that they will bring about the substantive evils that Congress has a right to prevent." The clear and present danger test of Schenck was extended in Debs v. United States, again by Justice Holmes. The case involves a speech made by Eugene V. Debs a political activist and socialist. Debs had not spoken any words that posed a clear and present danger to the conscription system, but a speech in which he denounced militarism was nonetheless found to be sufficient grounds for his conviction. Justice Holmes suggested that the speech had a, quote, natural tendency, end quote, to occlude the draft. Thus, the Supreme Court effectively shaped the First Amendment in such a manner as to permit a multitude of restrictions on speech. Further restrictions on speech were accepted by the Supreme Court when it decided Gitlow v. New York in 1925. Writing for the majority, Justice Edward Sanford suggested that the states could punish words that, quote, by their very nature involve danger to the public peace and to the security of the state, end quote. Lawmakers were given the freedom to decide which speech would constitute a danger. Freedom of speech was influenced by anti-communism during the Cold War. In 1940, Congress replaced the Sedition Act of 1918, which had expired in 1921. The Smith Act, passed in that year, made punishable the advocacy of, quote, the propriety of overthrowing or destroying any government of the United States by force and violence, end quote. The law was mainly used as a weapon against communist leaders. The constitutionality of the act was questioned in the case Dennis v. United States. The court upheld the law in 1951 by a 6-2 vote. Chief Justice Fred M. Vinson relied on Oliver Wendell Holmes' clear and present danger test when he wrote for the majority. Vinson suggested that the doctrine did not require the government to, quote, wait until the putsch is about to be executed, the plans have been laid, and the signal is awaited, end quote, thereby broadly defining the words clear and present danger. Thus, even though there was no immediate danger posed by the Communist Party's ideas, their speech was restricted by the court. Dennis v. United States has never been explicitly overruled by the court, but future decisions have in practice reversed the case. In 1957, the court changed its interpretation of the Smith Act in deciding Yates v. United States. The Supreme Court ruled that the act was aimed at, quote, the advocacy of action, not ideas, end quote. 
Thus the advocacy of abstract doctrine remains protected under the First Amendment. Only speech inciting the forcible overthrow of the government remains punishable under the Smith Act. Subsection 4.2 War Protests The Supreme Court, under Chief Justice Earl Warren, expanded free speech protections in the 1960s, though there were exceptions. However, in 1968, the court upheld a law prohibiting the mutilation of draft cards in United States v. O'Brien. The court ruled that protesters could not burn draft cards because doing so would interfere with the, quote, smooth and efficient functioning, end quote, of the draft system. Then again, in 1971, the court found that a person could not be punished for wearing in the corridors of the Los Angeles County Courthouse a jacket reading, Fuck the Draft, in Cohen v. California. In 1969, the Supreme Court ruled that free speech rights extended to students in school while deciding Tinker v. Des Moines. The case involved several students who were punished for wearing black armbands to protest the Vietnam War. The Supreme Court held that the school could not restrict symbolic speech that did not cause undue interruption of school activities. Justice Abe Fortas wrote, quote, State-operated schools may not be enclaves of totalitarianism. School officials do not possess absolute authority over their students. Students are possessed of fundamental rights which the state must respect, just as they themselves must respect their obligations to the state. End quote. The decision was arguably overruled, or at least undermined, by Bethel School District v. Fraser, 1986, in which the court held that a student could be punished for his speech before a public assembly. Also in 1969, the court decided the landmark Brandenburg v. Ohio, which overruled Whitney v. California, a 1927 case in which a woman was imprisoned for aiding the Communist Party. Brandenburg effectively swept away Dennis as well, casting the right to speak freely of violent action and revolution in broad terms. Quote, Our decisions have fashioned the principle that the constitutional guarantees of free speech and free press do not permit a state to forbid or proscribe advocacy of the use of force or of law violation except where such advocacy is directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and is likely to incite or produce such action." End quote. Some claim that Brandenburg essentially sets forth a reworded clear and present danger test, but the accuracy of such statements is hard to judge. The court has never heard or decided a case involving seditious speech since Brandenburg was handed down. Subsection 4.4 Flag Burning the divisive issue of flag burning as a form of protest came before the Supreme Court in 1989 as it decided Texas v. Johnson. The Supreme Court reversed the conviction of Gregory Johnson for burning the flag by a vote of 5-4. to four. Justice William J. Brennan, Jr. asserted that, quote, If there is a bedrock principle underlying our First Amendment, it is that the government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society finds the idea offensive or disagreeable." End quote. Many in Congress vilified the decision of the court. The House unanimously passed a resolution denouncing the court. The Senate did the same with only three dissents. Congress passed a federal law banning flag burning, but the Supreme Court struck it down as well in United States v. Eichmann, 1990. Many attempts have been made to amend the Constitution to allow Congress to prohibit the desecration of the flag. Since 1995, the flag-burning amendment has consistently mustered sufficient votes to pass the House of Representatives, but not in the Senate. In 2000, the Senate voted 63 to 37 in favor of the amendment, which fell four votes short of the requisite two-thirds majority. Subsection 4.5 Obscenity The federal government and the states have long been permitted to restrict obscene or pornographic speech. While obscene speech generally has no protection under the First Amendment, pornography is subject to little regulation. 
The exact definition of obscenity and pornography, however, has changed over time. When it decided Rosen v. United States in 1896, the Supreme Court adopted the same obscenity standard as had been articulated in a famous British case, Regina v. Hicklin. The Hicklin standard defined material as obscene if it tended, quote, to deprave or corrupt those whose minds are open to such immoral influences and into whose hands a publication of this sort may fall, end quote. Thus, the standards of the most sensitive members of the community were the standards for obscenity. In 1957, the court ruled in Roth v. United States that the Hicklin test was inappropriate. Instead, the Roth test for obscenity was, quote, whether to the average person, applying contemporary community standards, the dominant theme of the material, taken as a whole, appeals to the prurient interest, end quote. The Roth test was expanded when the court decided Miller v. California in 1973. Under the Miller test, a work is obscene if it would be found appealing to the prurient interest by an average person applying contemporary community standards, depicts sexual conduct in a patently offensive way, and has no serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. Note that community standards not national standards, are applied as to whether the material appeals to the prurient interest. Thus, the material may be deemed obscene in one locality but not in another. National standards, however, are applied as to whether the material is of value. Child pornography is not subject to the Miller test, as the Supreme Court decided in 1982. The court felt that the government's interest in protecting children from abuse was paramount. Yet, personal possession of obscene material in the home may not be prohibited by law. In writing for the court, in the case of Stanley v. Georgia, Justice Thurgood Marshall wrote, quote, If the First Amendment means anything, it means that a state has no business telling a man sitting in his own house what books he may read or what films he may watch." End quote. It is not, however, unconstitutional for the government to prevent the mailing or sale of obscene items, though they may be viewed only in private. Ashcroft v. Free Speech Coalition, 2002, further upholds these rights by invalidating the 1996 Child Pornography Prevention Act, holding that, quote, banning the depiction of pornographic images of children including computer-generated images, was overly broad and unconstitutional under the First Amendment." End quote. Justice Anthony M. Kennedy wrote, quote, First Amendment freedoms are most in danger when the government seeks to control thought or to justify its laws for that impermissible end. The right to think is the beginning of freedom, and speech must be protected from the government because speech is the beginning of thought. End quote. U.S. courts have upheld certain regulation of por pornographic speech. The courts have found that regulation and banning pornography as a way of protecting children meets the strict scrutiny test. A zoning regulation, which restricts where pornography can be viewed, is valid if the purpose for the statute is based on secondary efforts. The zoning may not be related to the suppression of the pornographic content, and the statute makes other ways of viewing the content. Subsection 4.5 Libel, Slander, and Private Action The American prohibition on defamatory speech, slander, and publications, libel, traces its origins to English law. The nature of defamation law was vitally changed by the Supreme Court in 1964 while deciding New York Times Company v. Sullivan. The New York Times had published an advertisement indicating that officials in Montgomery, Alabama had acted violently in suppressing the protests of African Americans during the Civil Rights Movement. The Montgomery Police Commissioner, L. B. Sullivan, sued the Times for libel on the grounds that the advertisement damaged his reputation. The Supreme Court unanimously overruled the $500,000 judgment against the Times. Justice William J. Brennan, 
it suggested that public officials may sue for libel only if the publisher published the statements in question with, quote, actual malice, end quote, a difficult standard to meet. The actual malice standard applies to both public officials and public figures, including celebrities. Though the details vary from state to state, private individuals normally need only to prove negligence on the part of the defendant. In Greenbelt Cooperative Publishing Association, Inc. v. Bresler, 398 U.S. 6, 1970, the Supreme Court ruled that an article which quoted a visitor to a city council meeting who didn't like Bresler's aggressive stance in negotiating with the city as blackmail to not be libelous, since nobody could believe anyone was claiming that Bresler had committed a crime and that the statement was essentially hyperbole, i.e. obviously an opinion. As the Supreme Court again ruled in Gertz v. Robert Welch, Inc., 1974, opinions cannot be considered defamatory. It is thus permissible to suggest, for instance, that a lawyer is a bad one, but not permissible to declare that the lawyer is ignorant of the law. The former constitutes a statement of values, but the latter is a statement alleging a fact. More recently, in Milkovich v. Lorraine Journal Company, 497 U.S. 1, 1990, the Supreme Court backed off from the protection of opinion announced in Gertz. The court in Milkovich specifically held that there is no wholesale exemption from defamation law for statements labeled opinion, but instead that a statement must be provably false, falsifiable, before it can be the subject of a libel suit. In 1988, Hustler Magazine v. Falwell extended the actual malice standard to intentional infliction of emotional distress in a ruling which protected a parodic caricature. In the ruling, actual malice was described as, quote, knowledge that the statement was false or with reckless disregard as to whether or not it was true, end quote. Ordinarily, the First Amendment only applies to prohibit direct government censorship. The protection from libel suits recognizes that the power of the state is needed to enforce a libel judgment between private persons. The Supreme Court's scrutiny of defamation suits is thus sometimes considered part of a broader trend in U.S. jurisprudence away from the strict state action requirement and into the application of First Amendment principles when private actors invoke state power. Likewise, the Noir Pennington Doctrine is a rule of law that often prohibits the application of antitrust law to statements made by competitors before public bodies. For instance, a monopolist may freely go before the city council and urge the denial of its competitor's building permit without being subject to the Sherman Act liability. This principle is being applied to litigation outside the antitrust context, including state tort suits for intentional interference with business relations and so-called slap suits. Similarly, some states have adopted under their protections for free speech the Pruneyard Doctrine, which prohibits private property owners whose property is equivalent to a traditional public forum, often shopping malls and grocery stores, from enforcing their private property rights to exclude political speakers and petition gatherers. This doctrine has been rejected as a matter of federal constitutional law, but is meeting with growing acceptance as a matter of state law. Subsection 4.7 Political Speech The Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971 and related laws restricted the monetary contributions that may be made to a political campaign and expenditure by the candidates. The Supreme Court considered the constitutionality of the act in Berkeley v. Vallejo, decided in 1976. The court affirmed some parts of the act and rejected others. The court concluded that limits on campaign contributions, quote, served the basic governmental interest in safeguarding the integrity of the electoral process without directly impinging upon the rights of individual citizens and candidates to engage in political debate and discussion. End quote. At the same time, 
the court overturned the expenditure limits, which it found imposed, quote, substantial restraints on the quantity of political speech, end quote. Further rules on campaign finance were scrutinized by the court when it determined McConnell v. Federal Election Commission in 2003. The case centered on the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002, a law that introduced several new restrictions on campaign financing. The Supreme Court upheld provisions which barred the raising of soft money by national parties and the use of soft money by private organizations to finance certain election-related advertisements. At the same time, the court struck down the, quote, choice of expenditure, end quote, rule, which required that parties could either make coordinated expenditures for all its candidates or permit candidates to spend independently, but not both, stating that the, quote, provision placed an unconstitutional burden on the party's right to make unlimited independent expenditures, end quote. The Supreme Court also ruled that the provision preventing minors from making political contributions was unconstitutional, relying on the precedent set in the Tinker case. For additional details, see Campaign Finance Reform. Subsection 4.8 Involuntary Commitment A small minority has questioned whether involuntary commitment laws, when the diagnosis of a mental illness leading in whole or in part to the commitment was made to some degree on the basis of the speech or writings of the committed individual violates the right of freedom of speech of such individuals. The First Amendment implications of involuntary psychiatric drugging have also been questioned. Though the District Court in Mills v. Rogers, 457 U.S. 291, 1982, found that, quote, Whatever powers the Constitution has granted our government, involuntary mind control is not one of them, end quote. This finding was not of precedential value, and the Supreme Court ruling was essentially inconclusive. Section 5. Freedom of the Press. Main article, Freedom of the Press. Freedom of the Press, like freedom of speech, is subject to restrictions on bases such as defamation law. Restrictions, however, have been struck down if they are aimed at the political message or content of newspapers. In Brandenburg v. Hayes, 1972, the court placed limits on the ability of the press to refuse subpoenas from a grand jury based on claims of freedom of the press. The issue decided in the case was whether a reporter could refuse to appear and testify before state and federal grand juries basing the refusal on the contention that such appearance and testimony, quote, abridges the freedom of speech and press guaranteed by the First Amendment, end quote. The 5-4 decision was that such a protection was not provided by the First Amendment. Subsection 5.1, Taxation of the Press. State governments retain the right to tax newspapers just as they may tax other commercial products. Generally, however, taxes that focus exclusively on newspapers have been found unconstitutional. In Grosjean v. American Press Company, 1936, the court invalidated a state tax on newspaper advertising revenues. Similarly, some taxes that give preferential treatment to the press have also been struck down. In 1987, for instance, the court invalidated an Arkansas law exempting, quote, religious, professional, trade, and sports journals, end quote, from taxation, since the law amounted to the regulation of newspaper content. In Leathers v. Medlock, 1991, the Supreme Court found that states may treat different types of the media differently, such as by taxing cable television, but not newspapers. The court found that, quote, differential taxation of speakers, even members of the press, does not implicate the First Amendment unless the tax is directed at, or presents the danger of suppressing, particular ideas, end quote. Subsection 5.2, Content Regulation. 
The courts have rarely treated content-based regulation of the press with any sympathy. In Miami Herald Publishing Company v. Torrio, 1971, the court unanimously struck down a state law requiring newspapers criticizing political candidates to publish the candidates' responses. The state claimed that the law had been passed to ensure press responsibility. Finding that only freedom and not press responsibility is mandated by the First Amendment, the Supreme Court ruled that the government may not force newspapers to publish that which they do not desire to publish. Content-based regulation of television and radio, however, has been sustained by the Supreme Court in various cases. Since there are a limited number of frequencies for non-cable television and radio stations, the government licenses them to various companies. The Supreme Court, however, has ruled that the problem of scarcity does not permit the raising of a First Amendment issue. The government may restrain broadcasters, but only on a content-neutral basis. Section 6. Petition and Assembly. Main Article. Freedom of Assembly. The right to petition the government has been interpreted as extending to petitions of all three branches, the Congress, the Executive, and the Judiciary. The Supreme Court has interpreted redress of grievances broadly. Thus, it is possible for one to request the government to exercise its powers in furtherance of the general public good. However, a few times Congress has directly limited the right to petition. During the 1790s, Congress passed the Alien and Sedition Act, punishing opponents of the Federalist Party. The Supreme Court never ruled on the matter. In 1835, the House of Representatives adopted the Gag Rule, barring abolitionist petitions calling for the end of slavery. The Supreme Court did not hear a case related to the rule which was in any event abolished in 1844. During World War I, individuals petitioning for the repeal of sedition and espionage laws, see above, were punished. Again, the Supreme Court did not rule on the matter. The right of assembly was originally closely tied to the right to petition. One significant case involving the two rights was United States v. Creekshank, 1876. There, the Supreme Court held that citizens may, quote, assemble for the purpose of petitioning Congress for a redress of grievances, end quote. Essentially, it was held that the right to assemble was secondary, while the right to petition was primary. Later cases, however, have expanded the meaning of the right to assembly. Hogg v. CIO, 1939, for instance, refers to the right to assemble for the, quote, communication of views on national questions, end quote, and for, quote, disseminating information, end quote. Section 7. International Significance. Most provisions of the United States Bill of Rights are based on the English Bill of Rights of 1689 and on other aspects of English law. The English Bill of Rights, however, does not include many of the protections found in the First Amendment. For example, while the First Amendment guarantees freedom of speech to the general populace, the English Bill of Rights only protects, quote, freedom of speech and debate or proceedings in Parliament, end quote. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, a French revolutionary document passed only weeks before Congress proposed the Bill of Rights, contains certain guarantees that are similar to the First Amendment. For instance, it suggests that, quote, every citizen may, accordingly, speak, write, and print with freedom, end quote. Freedom of speech in the United States is more extensive than in nearly any other nation in the world. While the First Amendment does not explicitly set restrictions on freedom of speech, other similar declarations of rights sometimes do so. The European Convention on Human Rights, for example, permits restrictions, quote, in the interest of national security, territorial integrity, or public safety, for the prevention of disorder or crime, for the protection of health or morals, for the protection of the reputation or rights of others, 
for preventing the disclosure of information received in confidence, or for maintaining the authority and impartiality of the judiciary, end quote. And in practice, these exceptions have been interpreted quite broadly by the courts of Europe. Section 8. See also. Establishment Clause. Free Exercise Clause. Freedom of Association. Freedom of Thought. Lemon v. Kurtzman established the Lemon Test for evaluating government violations of the Establishment Clause. Marketplace of Ideas. Religious Freedom Restoration Act an attempt by Congress to reinstate the Sherbert Test through legislation. Sherbert Test, established for evaluating government violations of the Free Exercise Clause. This sound file and all text of the article are licensed under the GNU Free Documentation License, available at www.gnu.org slash copyleft slash fdl. HTML. Have a nice day.